Hi, I'm Terry McGuire. I've been involved with Sensor for about uh, 12 years, and this is a seminar about work I've done on the education of science majors using a sensorized approach. Um, I always like to show this slide. This is me uh, uh, picking up honeybees, and I always feel like when I'm going to talk about teaching in front of faculty that you do need to wear appropriate protective gear because they are so possessive of what they've always done. Um, each generation has real expectations of their students. You know, my grandmother, for example, will always told me I was not an educated person because I didn't know the states and all their capitals from memory. Um, my father, my father-in-law thought I wasn't an educated person because I hadn't read the Harvard classics. He hadn't read them either, but he was sure that if he had, he would have been an educated person. The point is that now we look back, and these are generational things, and these goals seem pretty outdated and what would allow you to function in today's society. The problem is we still do this uh, as faculty because we try to tell our students how we got to be educated in what we are, even though that may not be relevant for uh, the way the needs are now. Uh, there are certainly historical changes uh, uh, in every generation. Uh, what we demand of our students now is more than they would have demanded a hundred years ago. Um, and we often call this change in what you need to know, critical thinking. Okay, so let's talk about majors. And there's really two groups of students in which we can innovate in a course quite well. One is non-majors. Uh, we can do almost anything in a non-majors course because we feel if they learn any science, that's better than if they have no science. So we can do any kind of innovative thing we want because it's not important for them to know in that sense. The other group of students that we uh, treat quite well and which are allowed to be interested are honor students. And here we know they have to learn the material, but we presume they will be bored in a regular course. They're smart enough to learn the facts on their own. And there's no reason that we have to torture them like we would torture a regular student. So if you're not a non-major or an honor student and you want to learn science, then there are expectations of what you should do. So how do we treat majors? In my opinion, we treat them quite badly. So here's a quote you've all heard. You give a man a fish, you have fed him for a lifetime. Teach a man a fish, and you have fed him for a lifetime. But if you're an introductory science major, however, before you're allowed to fish, please memorize the following information for each fish you might want to catch. And many different parts of the fish. And of course, there will be a quiz on this. And if you pass the quiz, maybe you'll be allowed to go fishing and do something interesting. Otherwise, we are back to start and you failed to become a productive fisher person. So let's think about our attitudes about introductory science majors. They're actually quite uh, low. We think that introductory science majors are expected to be bored. I've had many faculty tell me they, in that fact, science majors should learn to be bored. Science is actually boring. Kind of an appalling thing to hear from a science faculty person. Uh, and the next thing is uh, before Anything interesting we can taught, the student must memorize many, many, many facts. There's no way you can talk to a student until they have memorized more facts than anybody would ever need to know before you can get on to anything interesting. Um, now, students actually respond to this. They are incredibly good at memorizing. They have gone through school memorizing. They can regurgitate those facts on tests. It's a six survival system. But it may not be what we really want to do in the 21st century. I'm reminded here of William Perry at Harvard, uh, who did a lot of research on cognitive levels and kind of thinking in the 1970s and earlier. And he gave 1,500 Harvard students a 30-page uh, book chapter to read in history, uh, saying they had 20 minutes to read it, and then they would be given a quiz, and they might have to identify important details and write an essay. When the 20 minutes were up, the students did, 1,500 students, they all did extremely well on the simple multiple choice test and getting every major fact. However, when they asked them to write a summary paragraph, only 15 out of 1,500 could actually do it. And the problem is, Perry called this a term I love, obedient purposelessness, in which uh, they would learn exactly what they needed to get on to the next level, without, but not going beyond what they needed to learn. And he called this an enormous amount of wasted effort in education where all they could do is do whatever the minimum required to get on to the next level. And I think that's what we often do in introductory science courses and something we should get beyond 
uh, certainly in uh, modern courses. Uh, here, ironically, are my first students. Uh, people say they like to bring their research in the lab. My first research was actually on learning and memory. These are blowflies. Um, and uh, I learned a lot about training blowflies. I was one of the first person to teach blowflies anything. That's not necessarily a good thing. But, but I realized that if I treated my students as well as I treated my blowflies, I could come up with, if I could teach a blowfly, I could probably teach almost any student in my lab who are much more intelligent than blowflies. And the same innovation and effort I put into teaching flies, I could put into my own students, hopefully with even better results than I did in my PhD dissertation. I will actually come back to these flies. The important thing to remember is I could teach the, I could set a criterion that the flies had to reach and come up with innovative ways for those flies to reach that criterion. Okay, so uh, using this, I began to uh, rethink how we educate average students. A lot of this is in my backgrounder on the sensor website. Uh, but there are four things I would like to uh, use to structure this. And there are four points I want you to keep in mind. One is I decided all students have the potential to excel. Two, science must be connected to the real world. We will discuss all these in greater detail. Three, if we can clearly define your learning goals for my course, you can then design the course and the assessments in the course to meet those goals. And I also realize that knowledge is not a race, that, that no one has to, there should not be a starting point, that everybody has to be at the same place when they start, nor is there a defined finishing line, and they do not all have to go at the same speed. And if we put these in mind, we can come up with a very different course than we teach uh, right now. So, first thing, and this is actually, I shouldn't even have to say this is a thing, but students are neither stupid nor lazy or unprepared. And if you start out thinking your students are like that, you are, they're wrong and they're also very insulting. If you think that they are smart, they may have other problems, they may have personal problems, but they are generally capable of learning. Now, if you start with this basic premise, you're, you realize your job is not to sort the students into your categories, i.e. A, B, C, D, and F, but rather can we help each student learn to their potential and hopefully every student learn everything that you want to teach them. Okay. Now, we fall back on these characterizations when our wonderful, beautiful teaching techniques fall flat. Uh, but it's maybe more of a problem of how we teach rather than their ability to learn. And if you realize your students, especially your majors, are motivated to learn science, there's no reason you shouldn't expect every one of them to excel in the courses that you give them. And I said, the next step then was how I... Uh, set the courses up, you realize that if I decide that every student could reach a criterion, that is basically my learning goals. I can set a goals that say what is a passing grade or an ex excellent grade in this course. And then I say, how could every student make it? Um, so I have set up the criterion they have to reach. And then this, my course is structured on making, having them do the assessments and the problems and, and so forth to meet those criteria. And therefore, I can reasonably expect that every student had the capacity to get an A. Will they do that? To no, but it's generally not because of the course, it's because of other things going on in their life. Some students don't need an A and are putting their effort into other courses. But that should be your expectation in any course is that every student should be allowed to get an A. All right. Science must be connected to the real world. That's a really interesting idea. Uh, when I first came back from Sensor and taught a genetics course, I put in a one-minute paper uh, based on a, I added current events and I asked students about the current event at the end of the course. And the term that came up over and over and over again, to my great surprise, is the surprise students had that genetics was connected to the real world. I probably got two or three comments like that every class period. And I realized that the real world is nebulous to the students. They take the course, it's obedient purposelessness. They take everything they do to pass the course to get an A, but they have no expectation that this has anything to do with their life, except the immediate passing of the course. And so I realized that if we look at, if we're serious about science, that the basis of all science is naturalistic observation and curiosity. It is not the scientific method. 
First, we see something and we wonder why that happens. And you need to put, and, and that is happening in the real world, either you're doing it with your naked eye or you're doing it under a microscope or you're doing it with high tech, but it's observation and curiosity. And if we don't feed that, then we're not really teaching science. We're teaching memorization. I like this quote, um, science is at its core a method, a rational mode of investigating the world. That is a way of using experimentation to address our curiosity and answer the question, why did that happen? And this is from an interesting uh, science fiction story called the Mendelian Lamp Case, uh, where it turns out Amish are using genetic engineering to breed fireflies to, uh, <laughs> to light the world. Okay, the point is, in introductory courses, we, all to, we present numerous facts, and fact after fact after fact, beyond any, uh, anybody's ability to do it, and we ignore the, uh, that each fact is the culmination of years of observation and experimentation. We take the shortcut. This is what we know. We don't tell them why we know it, how we know it, and who came up with it. And putting that curiosity back into the course is actually critical for them to realize they too could be scientists. Now, if you're going to redesign a course for majors to make it more interactive and sensorized, if we like to say, the first you need to define your learning goals. And after you define your learning goals, then you, you can design your course and your assessments. And I'm going to go back to the assessments. If your assessments don't encourage students to learn the way you want, you really don't have a course that's going to do what you would like. Okay. So. Now the lowest level goal is all too typical in the course, and that's something like students should read one or two or three chapters per week of a textbook, listen to lectures, or read the textbook in some sequence, and then they should get an A, B, or C on the standardized test prepared by the author of the textbook. That's not teaching. That is a low goal. Can you memorize and transcribe? Um, and this again, would, going back to Perry, would be a good example of obedient purposelessness. The students will do this quite well. They will even like doing it because it is so easy, in many senses, to memorize and regurgitate. It's not very good for later courses, but it will definitely get them through this course. And if these are your goals, then this talk is really I have nothing to add because this is not the goal that, I, uh, that I've ever had. I certainly have it no longer. Um, and again, both faculty and students are quite comfortable with this approach. Uh, if you use a standardized test, you don't even have to make up your own tests. And the students can memorize everything in the book, and they will get the A. Uh, it's really easy. And they will actually resist change, because doing something different forces a higher level of preparation. That's a lot harder. OK. And I realize when we come back to the real world, which is one of my goals, that if I present my course as a standalone course, then the students will, also, will view my knowledge as disconnected factoids. Genetics is separate from chemistry. It's separate from physics. It's separate from zoology. It's separate from everything. It doesn't even connect to other courses. Um, and if you, this is the way you treat your course. This is the way the students will treat the course. Um, we need to encourage the students to see the connections by modeling how scientists and scholars see the connections. We are sure we know chemistry is important for genetics. We know mathematics is important for genetics, but we never actually tell students or model why this happens, how we have to look things up in other disciplines and so forth. You have to build the connections or they won't see the connections. Um, so it's really important that we connect this to other courses and we connect this to the real world. Um, and I think most importantly, we need to connect science to their everyday life uh, and showcase the limits of our knowledge. I've had students wondering, wanting to do research but didn't know what they could research because we already knew everything there was to know about genetics. But if you show them the limits of our knowledge and we show them how genetics might uh, be used in politics or might be used in medicine or might be used in animal breeding, you realize there's a whole world out there that we know nothing about and that they are uh, able to uh, involve themselves and think about science not only with other courses, but in, in their day-to-day -day life. OK. Um, another goal is to teach students how to find and evaluate information. And this is to prepare them to become future learners. 
no matter how well they do in one of my courses, it's a semester. And I want them to be able to use the information they learn in my class for life uh, long learning. And so the first thing I say, realize in where it didn't used to be true with the internet, information is readily available. There is more information available than you could possibly get, in, uh, get into a textbook. And I also tell the students over and over, life is an open book test. Only in a course do we expect them to rely solely on their memory to answer a question. Uh, you would never do that in, a, in anything critically important. You would never do that in a job. So why do we teach them for a skill that is not going to be useful the rest of their life? Okay. What is important is critical evaluation of the source of information. That becomes even more important as uh, the Internet allows the proliferation of pseudoscience websites, biased websites, and so forth. How do you know the information you're, you're reading has any reliability? How do you assess that? Much more important than relying on memorization of a few facts. And we need to model as faculty, our value add is to model the critical thought for our students. How do we think about information? How do we look at the limits of things and teach the students how we evaluate information so that they can do the same thing, evaluate information for their ability to, take, uh, to learn a subject. And if we do this, we realize that much of our teaching effort might be diverted out of the platform lecture, per se, and developing support materials, which can go on the internet or other ways, to support class discussion than just giving another lecture, which will repeat the same facts that are readily available many other places. OK. Now, I think nothing can act. No. Nothing can be actually uh, uh, done until we end the tyranny of the textbook. And I don't think I can say enough about this. No, I think hardly any new curriculum will succeed if we have to structure a course to the demands of a textbook. Textbooks were great in their time, but they are no longer the uh, thing that we need. Uh, textbooks are actually the consensus of experts in the field. These are going to be much older than the students. They are, after all, experts in the field. They may be one or two generations older than the students. And what these experts try to do in a textbook is reconstruct how they think they learned the discipline. It is not the only way to learn a discipline. It may not even be possible to learn a discipline that way anymore, but they are absolutely sure that the way they learn the discipline is the way every new uh, entering person should learn the discipline. And so they become very constrained and locked in a 20 or 30 or 40 year old pathway to learning a particular discipline. Um, when it, and it's interesting, this, textbooks can only happen in an established field. In a new field, people enter from all kinds of places. Uh, for example, there's a new field in my department called computational genetics. People are entering that field from genetics, from mathematics, from computer science, from quantum mechanics, all kinds of places. It's really an exciting place to be. Unfortunately, in a few years, someone will get the idea of writing a textbook and then lock into place the way you have to become a computational geneticist in a way calcifying how students learn and making it really kind of uh, making it very rigid. It's very interesting. I once had someone told me that you could not possibly learn genetics unless you knew chemistry. And I said, Mendel did fine. Thank you very much. But the idea you forget that you do not need, there's not one way to learn it. There are many different points of entry into a field. Textbooks tend to lock you into one linear approach. Textbooks are also written without regard to how people learn. Very often, they give you massive amounts of theory first, and concrete examples come later. So I remember looking at an introductory chemistry course, and it said, this is chemistry, and now let's tell you about orbitals. The point is, if observation comes first, then concrete examples are first, and then theory comes to help explain. Theory and experimentation explain those examples, and you build from uh, concrete to much more abstract, not the other way around. Textbooks are also written at one cognitive level. From chapter 1 through chapter 800, that would be an intro bio textbook, 
Um, they are not set up to encourage the movement to critical thinking. They start out at one level, they end up at that level. There's nowhere during the semester where students can reach higher levels of thought because they are taught at one level all the way through. And that's another uh, thing that stops innovation is that when you never move to critical thinking if you don't uh, bring students along. Um, textbooks force a linear structure on the acquisition of knowledge. You start at A, you end at Z, this is the way you learn it. But self-learning is a nonlinear process. The internet is a much more reasonable way to learn material than a textbook because you can move to the topics you, you uh, need to know, you can go on sidetracks, you can come back to the main point. Our learning is a network, not a linear structure. But we, in a textbook, we have a linear structure, and there's, it's hard to get past that. As I said, students can enter the field from many different starting points and still end up with all of the information. Uh, textbooks do not tend to put you uh, into that field. I also want to say that learning curves will vary from student to student. Some students will do really well in the beginning part of the course and bog down in the middle. Others will have a hard time getting started but do well in the middle and some will not get it to the end and we have to allow that to be part of the way students learn or we have doomed a number of students to failure. So I go back to the flies. Um, again, uh, you know, I bring my research in the lab. It Tw took 20 years to get there but I did do it. And, and what do we know about flies? One is that when I have flies, the individual differences in the flies are greatest in the middle of the training. At the start of the trainings, all flies are pretty stupid. They can't do it. I won't say our students are stupid, but at the beginning of the course, they're going to be, they're all pretty, in the upper level course especially, they're all going to pretty much have the same level of, of knowledge. Um, as they begin to learn, some will excel early on, some will be, will be slow catching on, but in the middle of the course, they are going to be the biggest amount of individual differences. If I put most of my uh, in measurements in the middle of the course, I will get the largest grade distribution. At the end of the training, all these flies will have reached criteria and there should be very few individual differences. And so if I want maximum individual differences, I measure in the middle. If I want minimum, I measure at the end. I also want to point out that acquisition of knowledge and memory are not the same thing. That uh, all these flies could remember, but uh, the memory may not last more than a short period of time, depending on how I space my, uh, train, my acquisition trials. And this will have some relevance for the way we design our courses. This is Herbin Ebbinghaus. Uh, memory, this is generally memory based on nonsense syllables. Uh, now, presumably in most courses we're not teaching nonsense, although if we teach poorly, that's what the students are hearing. But he, what he learned is if you space the trials, if you have breaks between each trial of maybe a day, maybe longer, the more you space the trials, the more um, memory will occur. They won't learn any faster, but the memory will last longer. That is an extremely reliable phenomenon. The worst, even if you give the same amount of acquisition, if you do it all in one day, they're not going to remember anything past short-term memory. Why is this relevant to our course, to our teaching? Because traditional tests, multiple choice tests given in the middle of the semester, i.e. midterms, place premiums on short-term memory. You can cram, you can get an A, you can do a core dump, and your memory will not last more than a week or two. Okay, So if you're going to go for lifetime learning, you want to dump those high-risk middle tests and go to other forms of assessment uh, to help their acquisition and to consolidate their memories. They want to space their tasks throughout the semester. So you're going to need other forms of testing if you have different goals that if I want them to remember the material, if I want them to do critical thinking, I have to do something be beyond traditional testing. And this is where much of the design in my course comes from. I do many, many different assessments to the course. Most of these are low stakes. These are formative assessments. These are assessments that allow me to get feedback on how the students are doing 
It, it influences how I teach the very next time I go into the classroom. It tells me what students are doing bad. And there's a lot of them here. None of these are high stakes in the sense that they can blow their grade in the first few weeks of the course. I do pre-tests. I do online quizzes taken before class on, on, online. Lots of in-class group work, in-class reviews of what we covered the last lecture. They may read original research paper. Lots of jigsaw type things in recitation where they teach each other. Lots of weekly homeworks. All very low stakes. They're all graded, but it'd be really hard to lose your grade uh, early in the course. You can do badly and you can still keep up. You can still do well. Because these are to not only look at their acquisition, but to help them consolidate their memory. Of course, I have to have end of the course summative assessments. I have to know how well they did. Uh, I tend to use open uh, take home open book tests where I can look for the critical thinking that they've been modeling throughout the semester in the homeworks, the recitations, and so forth. I may do papers or projects that allow them to apply their information to the things they're doing. And then I usually have a knowledge post-test that matches the knowledge pre-test. So I have objective thought uh, evidence that they have actually learned those basic principles I'm sure that anybody completing my course should know. And although they do very poorly on the pre-test, on the post-test, they almost all get B pluses or A's. And these are the 40 things you better know if you come out of my course. I should note that the first two assessments, the take-home open book tests and the papers or projects, require higher levels of knowledge than mere memorization. They're open book. You don't have to, you can look anything up, but can you answer a question that's capacious and open-ended? Uh, and these all measure if the students have reached the criterion that I set for the original part of the course. How do the students respond? Uh, well, I've got many formal assessments that say they do quite well, including the most meaningful to me is that some of them take my upper level courses and they are and do extremely well. There are standouts over people who didn't take my lower courses. But I also have student quotes all used with permission. Uh, you know, the structure of the class really helped you make sure you got all the information as you went, whereas in a larger class, a student would have most likely have taken a few big tests. If you didn't know something, you wouldn't have an opportunity to find out until you missed it on an exam. The frequent formative assessments allow the students to know where they're at and allow you to know where they're at before the high stakes testing that would is the grade destroyer, basically. Uh, you know, this one, uh, Helen, who is now a completed her PhD in doing postdoc and uh, actually uh, gave her great foundation index and benefits of course today. And Jessica um, offered a letter of support if we needed some evidence that this was actually an effective approach to the major. <clears throat> uh, I have put these into action in several different courses. Uh, the one I would direct you to if you want to see how I've done it is the uh, is a sensor model course called Evolutionary Medicine. Uh, and this will go through in much more detail how I put my ideas for courses for science majors into practice. All right, thank you very much.